Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing. I am Council Member Julissa Ferreras Copeland. I'm the chair of the committee. We've been joined by Minority Leader Mario um, and other members will be joining us throughout this morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the members of the Council's Economic Development Task Expenditure Task Force whose work brought us to today's hearing. Along with Council Member Dan Garodnik and myself, the task force members were Michael Dardia, Hector Figueroa, Marilyn Marks Rubin, Marvin Marcus, James Parrott, Seth Pinsky, Mike Simas, and Javier Valdez. Thank you also to OMB, the Department of Finance, and of course, IBO, for your partnership. Um, and, and of course, none of this work would have worked had we, um, would, none of this would have been possible without Latanya McKinney and Dr. Ray Majeski and their team at the Council of Finance. Today the committee is holding an oversight hearing on the Independent Budget Office evaluation of the Commercial Revitalization Program, CRP, and the Commercial Expansion Program, CEP. The evaluation was conducted pursuant to Local Law 18 of 2017, which this council passed in order to create a formal process for the evaluation of city economic development tax expenditures. Local Law 18 was the outcome of the recommendations made by the task force. The task force met over the course of 20 months between January 2015 and September 2016 and explored how the council could improve its oversight of New York City's economic development tax expenditures. In fiscal 2017, these tax expenditures cost the city nearly $2.8 billion. In general, tax expenditures commonly referred to as tax breaks are revenue losses that result from a special exclusion or deduction given to specific taxpayers that exempt them from paying a tax they would otherwise have to pay. Economic development tax expenditures, which were the focus of the tax force, are those provided to induce behavior directly related to providing business or investment income. Historically, tax expenditures have not been subject to the same kind of oversight as other parts of the budget, even though they are used as a substitute for direct spending to achieve similar social goals. However, as a result of this local law, the city of New York became the first muni municipality in the nation to adopt a systemized tax expenditure review process and bring stronger accountability to these expenditures. The Council, in collaboration with IBO, selected the CRP and the CEP for the first evaluation conducted under Local Law 18. Briefly, the CRP was created in 1995 to increase occupancy and encourage investment in the commercial space in Lower Manhattan and certain other areas of the city. The program provides a property tax abatement for tenants of buildings built from 1975 who may <clears throat> who make certain minimum expenditures to improve their premises. Landlords and tenants are required to apply for the program jointly, and the landlord is required to pass the benefit on to the tenant as a result as a rent reduction. In addition to the property tax abatement, certain CRP recipients are eligible to receive a reduction in their commercial rent tax liabilities. The portion of the CRP that applied to areas outside of Lower Manhattan was amended and expanded in 2005 to create the CEP. The CEP provides a property tax abatement for tenants in commercial offices and industrial and manufacturing spaces built in 1999. The eligibility requirements are modeled by the CRP but differ slightly with respect to the minimum expenditures required. According to the Department of Finance in fiscal 2017, the property tax abatements for both programs, programs combined cost the city about $18.4 million in foregone tax revenue and the commercial rent tax reduction costs an additional $9 million. Today the committee will hear a preliminary report from IBO on its evaluation. Upon conclusion of the evaluation, IBO will submit a final report to the Council that will include a more thorough analysis of the effectiveness of the CRP and the CEP, and an analysis of whether these programs are achieving their goals and if the goals are still relevant, and recommendations for future evaluations. We will now hear testimony from the Independent Budget Office about their experiences conducting the first tax expenditure evaluation and their conclusion 
about the programs they've reviewed. I want to thank IBO for their work, and I'll have uh, you begin after you're sworn in by my council. We've been joined by council members Rosenthal and Kumbo. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, I'm Ronnie Lowenstein from the Independent Budget Office, um, and I have the happy job of basically thanking you. Um, we really appreciated the opportunity to work with the, your, the chair and the council members, the council as a whole, and especially council finance and the economists at council finance. Uh, it's the first time we've done a cooperative project of this, of this sort. Um, it was a long time coming. I think we've produced something of value for the city as a whole, and I look forward to more cooperation in the future. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is George Sweeting, uh, also from IBO. And um, the, the chair actually covered most of what I was going to say, which was to uh, acknowledge that we are, uh, you know, today, today's presentation is, um, you know, summarizes our findings and our results. Uh, we will be, we are working on a formal written report that will be submitted uh, in the, probably early in, in the next year. And, um, you know, it will cover not just our findings, but some of the issues that we encountered, some of the challenges we encountered in, in doing this work. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Arash Farahani, who uh, is the uh, economist at IBO that we added to our staff to do these, this type of work and uh, has led the first uh, evaluation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, um, thank you for opportunity to uh, give us a humble summary uh, of what we're doing in uh, just 40 slides today. Um, so we, uh, as a lot of uh, what was discussed uh, is going to go into our review of the programs, as, uh, uh, so uh, we might go a little bit faster over those. So um, uh, in 1984 to 1992, the uh, downtown office uh, vacancy rate went from 11% to 22%. Prompted by this, in 1995, commercial revitalization program came into effect. What it does is a property tax abatement and a commercial tax reduction for non-residential lower Manhattan buildings south of Moria Street that were built before 1975. In 2000, um, as an expansion to this program to outer boroughs, basically, uh, commercial expansion program, or CEP, uh, came into effect. Uh, it is only a property tax abatement because there is no commercial rent tax uh, for uh, outside of Manhattan. Um, and it is again for non-residential buildings uh, in Manhattan north of 96th Street and outer boroughs um, that are built now before 1999. So anything basically built before 2000 when the law came into effect was eligible for this program. Uh, in 2005, CRP expansion program um, uh, expanded the commercial rent tax reduction part of the program uh, to non-residential buildings uh, that are uh, uh, south of Canal Street uh, and are built at any time, basically. At the same time, other programs were uh, targeted, uh, were targeting th these areas. Uh, the 421G program for conversion of uh, commercial buildings into multiple dwellings in, uh, in the CRP region uh, basically gives 14-year 14, uh, 14 abatement of uh, about 80% of real estate uh, taxes paid on the property before conversion to a residential dwelling. Um, in 2005, at the same time with the uh, expansion of CRP program, commercial rent tax exemptions uh, were for World Trade Center and uh, CRT exemptions for all downtown uh, ground floor retail uh, were also included in the same law. So what do we find in evaluating these programs? So these programs, as it was mentioned, uh, cost uh, 27.4 million, uh, including the property tax abatement and uh, commercial rent tax uh, reductions. 
uh, participation rates in CRP is 22%, uh, while it is only 1% uh, maximum for the CEP program. Um, in terms of effects, downtown vacancy rates went, went down after 1995 indeed. Uh, however, we do not find that it was because of the CRP program, but it was rather market forces. Uh, employment numbers show a, a similar result. And in terms of design, uh, we find that participants in the program already, inv uh, already invest much more than the minimum required of physical improvements uh, that are included with these laws. Uh, so what are the participation requirements? Uh, there's lease terms and physical improvements. Uh, for small firms that, are, that have uh, fewer than 125 employees, you have to have a three-year or longer lease for both programs. Uh, for, um, and you also need to make $5 minimum uh, physical improvements that are required for CRP and CEP, and uh, it is $2.5 for CEP program. If you're a larger firm and your number of employees are more than 125, um, so your lease needs to be 10 years and the minimum physical requirement, uh, physical improvement requirements are much higher. There are $35 and $25 for CRP and CEP respectively. So what do you receive in return for the investments and the lease terms that you have? Uh, you receive uh, the minimum, uh, the, the applicants receive their minimum of uh, their property taxes and two and a half dollars, whichever is less. Uh, for three or five years, uh, they, these uh, benefits are received with two year phase out of schedule. And uh, the commercial rent tax reduction is, um, also uh, three or is 100% of gross rent and uh, three or five years with two year phase out. After 2005, the phase out was uh, not included in the law, so you receive 100% uh, reduction for the whole period of five years. As, as it was mentioned before, uh, these programs cost $27.4 million in 2017. Uh, and that is equivalent to paying 197 police officers per year. Uh, just to wrap our uh, mind around what this number means. Uh, property tax abatement is $18.4 million, commercial rent tax re reduction $9 million. And uh, we want to evaluate this program with all the benefits and all the requirements. Uh, so the first uh, starting point for us is what are the goals of the program? What were the goals of the program? Uh, does the law state the goals of these programs? No, we believe that it is a shortcoming and uh, that's something that we need to address. Uh, based on the testimonies and the design of the program, uh, the assumed uh, CRP and CEP goals in our view are, uh, and this was in collaboration with the city council um, um, to, to come up with these laws, uh, with, with these goals. Uh, is first of all to reduce vacancy rates. Uh, in the short term, the program does this by uh, giving benefits uh, in return for occupying these older units. Uh, in the long term, um, through building improvements. So if you are making an investment um, in a building, you're, you're gonna have a better quality and it's going to be uh, it, um, occupied with a higher probability. So that, that would be the idea. Um, at the same time, uh, to increase employment. So to evaluate, uh, we look at the program participation rates, uh, we look at neighborhood effects, um, which are office vacancy rates and rent, um, employment level, and also we, we look at data on um, building level data uh, on investments or physical changes to these buildings and uh, owner's rental, rental income. So looking at these, our idea is to uh, evaluate um, are the, whether the programs are meeting their goals, are the goals still relevant, and are the uh, programs efficient. So just keep, let's keep, uh, let us keep that in mind while we're uh, going over the different results. We have collected uh, a lot of data from uh, various sources to do this evaluation, uh, but there are a lot of um, limitations also. 
uh, what we have uh, are neighborhood uh, office rent and vacancy rates, zip code by industry employment, uh, building a square foot, other exemptions, uh, and more from the administrative property tax assessments, owner's rental income, um, and a CRP and CEP applications. So with these applications um, in 2010 to 2017, basically everything that uh, went in on the application forms were digitized. So that includes addresses, lease terms, program types, expenditures, number of employees. Uh, so anything that was required by the program. Um, in, um, through, uh, from 1995 to 2010 though, uh, only addresses, lease terms, and program types were digitized. Um, and detailed records are also destroyed for applicants prior to 2005 altogether, uh, which is a, a common procedural um, trend for, for all the programs. Uh, for 2005 to 2010, there are hard copies, but uh, it, it, is, uh, it will be costly to digitize them at this point. Um, so what we, what we do not have is also important because that, that has limited our ability to do some of the analysis that we thought we could do. So uh, building level vacancy rates, establishment by address level employment, income and expense for all owners um, are among the data sets uh, that are available but we do not have access to. Uh, so these can be uh, very easily turned from red to green for <laughs> us. Um, for, but there are other limitations that are procedural. So commercial rent tax data did not record CRP special reductions until 2017, and there are no building level data. Um, so, and also there's no consistent record of past property tax abatements. Uh, these are only recorded on a rolling basis. Uh, so if you want to look at the history, that is not currently or easily uh, accessible at this point. So all of these have led us to uh, come up with our plan Bs, um, which is what we're going to see today. The first thing to look at is the eligibility and participation rates. Um, so who are we giving this program to? Who is becoming eligible? So for the CRP, uh, we the uh, so here on the uh, vertical axis, we see the gross square footage, um, and on the horizontal axis, uh, it is different years. Um, the blue parts of each bar show uh, the square footage of eligible buildings for the CRP region, um, and uh, the rest of uh, the bars basically show who is not eligible and why. Um, and um, note that these are only uh, the mixed use and uh, commercial buildings uh, that are in the CRP region, or which basically downtown. Um, so um, the takeaway from this is that basically most of the buildings are eligible uh, in the downtown areas. Most of the commercial and mixed use buildings are eligible for the CRP uh, program. This was much, uh, it, was, it was true to a greater uh, extent uh, before uh, 2001 uh, because World Trade Center was one of the buildings, um, um, included some of the buildings that were eligible for the program. Um, and um, today, this is true to a lesser extent. So the number of buildings built before 1975 uh, is declining. There are newer buildings built. Also, there are class changes. So there are buildings that were old before, and now they, they, are, they are not uh, commercial anymore. Uh, so they're res residential. So these two trends are noteworthy uh, when it comes to who is taking advantage of the program and whether it is, uh, how relevant it is for today. Um, how about participation rates? Uh, so Obviously, in 1995, the participation rate was zero. Um, uh, on the vertical axis, we see uh, the percentage of the eligible buildings that are participating or that are enrolled in this, uh, in this program at any time. Um, 
the most clear um, green line is showing uh, the, the participation rates for CRP. We see that it is peaking uh, in 2009 uh, at 22%, so that would be like this point here. Um, and uh, it is declining in the financial crisis. Um, so just focusing on the CRP program for a moment, uh, we should note that uh, it is not a um, uh, it is not a counter cyclical uh, participation rate. So it is not the case that when the market is low, there are a lot of people that need this program and are coming to take advantage of this. It is that when the market is uh, doing well anyway, there are a lot of buildings that are participating in the program. Um, at the same time, uh, down here, you might not have noticed without the legend that we have uh, CEP participation rates and CRP05 participation rates. Uh, so the maximum for the CEP is uh, in 2017 and it is only 1%. So it has been growing over time, but uh, there are basically all of the buildings, uh, all the commercial buildings built before 1999 are eligible for this program. Uh, and uh, participation rates are very low. Uh, for CRP05, uh, it is the same thing. So uh, it has been growing, but it is at its maximum um, in 2017, uh, only at 2%. Um, so in summary, uh, the majority of downtown building offices um, are eligible for the program. Uh, note that about 12 million square feet were turned residential only because of the 421G program that we discussed earlier. Um, the maximum CRP participation rate was 22%, and although the number of CRP applications are rising, it is uh, only 1% at its highest. So what were the effects of participating in the programs? Uh, we first, uh, we want to evaluate if it worked. So that is in simple terms what we want to look at now. Um, to do that, we, uh, we asked the basic question, uh, what would have happened without these programs? So that is, that is our initial starting point of analysis. Um, but for the solution concept, we consider an experiment with a treatment and a control group, um, and we compare the outcomes of the two groups. Uh, so the control group is going to um, represent what would have happened without the program, the, the people who did not have the program but had the same outcomes, or had may, maybe different outcomes. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, for office vacancy rates, uh, we have collected data from Cushman and Wakefield uh, at the neighborhood level from 1984 to 2016. Um, here we can see the vacancy rates uh, in downtown area from 1984 to 2016. Um, so this is the 22% or so um, vacancy rate that uh, was alarming to the lawmakers uh, to come up with something to reduce the vacancy rates in downtown area. We see that after 1992, uh, it has already started to decline. Uh, but after 1995, we see a very sharp decline. Um, and we know that the CRP started in 1995, so the question is, uh, was it CRP or was it something else? So the green line here is uh, showing the percentage of buildings that are enrolled in CRP, uh, percentage of all buildings in downtown that are uh, enrolled in CRP. So we see that in the uh, 1995 to 1997 period that we see a very sharp decline in uh, CRP. Uh, there aren't that many applicants um, uh, who are in the CRP program. So, this can, so it doesn't seem like all of the decline could be possibly explained by the APMA participation in the CRP program. Um, we also see that uh, the average vacancy rate over time in downtown has been 12.4% over 1984 to 2016. Um, 
So how do we how do we make the final judgment? We want to compare these numbers with the midtown uh, area vacancy rates. Uh, so to do that, we first look at the deviations from the historical averages for these two uh, series over time. Um, so the blue line here uh, is now downtown. The red line is midtown. And uh, both of these are now averaging around zero because we have subtracted their averages from, from them over time uh, to, make, uh, to be able to compare the trends, not the levels over time. Um, so what you can see is that midtown uh, also had a very high vacancy rate in 1992. It also had a very sharp decline um, until 2000. So, but Midtown, Midtown area didn't receive uh, a CRP program uh, and still had the same rents. In fact, if we look at the Hudson, Hudson River in New Jersey, we will see the same trends. If we look at the Midtown South, we see the same trends. So for whatever area that we have had data of, uh, in the New York uh, vicinity, we, we see the similar trends. Um, so we do not observe any off-the-trend effects of the CRP uh, on vacancy rates. Similar trends in other areas, including uh, Hudson Waterfront in New Jersey, are observed. And considering 1984 to 2000, if we run a regression and formalize this in a difference in difference uh, strategy, which is commonly used for such analysis, uh, we see very small negative effects, which is statistically insignificant. Uh, in simple terms, we, there, we do not find any effects of the CRP uh, program on the vacancy rate. Uh, similarly, no effects are found uh, for office rents, which we did not present here today. How about employment? Um, so again, we are looking at the trends in downtown area uh, over time. Now uh, the vertical axis is showing the uh, number of employees uh, in downtown area. Um, and. Uh, the different colors of each bar are showing the industry mix of jobs. Um, two things that are noticeable are that the trends are very similar to the vacancy rates that we saw. When the vacancy rate is high, we expect the employment to be low, and that is what we are observing here. Uh, the number of employees in 1993 experienced its lowest, and then it grew throughout the uh, through, through, uh, throughout the rest of the decade. Um, we also see that a lot of the buildings, uh, a lot of the jobs in downtown are in finance and insurance. It is no uh, surprise to anyone uh, in this audience, I believe. But uh, what we see is that the number of finance and insurance jobs as a percentage has declined over time in downtown area. And in general, the number of jobs are lower than they were before in downtown. Uh, again, we talked about the buildings being more residential at this point. That might be one of the factors, but not all. So the summary of employment, are now. Um, uh, we're not going to go through all of our analysis for employment. Again, we see very similar trends are found in, um, in Midtown for employment. Uh, however, downtown employment grew slower in 1995 to 2000 than Midtown. Um, and industry composition matters a lot. So finance jobs grew faster or slower. Uh, that's going to, uh, whether they grew faster or slower is going to determine what happened to uh, downtown area. So after controlling for industry composition, uh, post-1995, downtown still grew at a slower rate than Midtown. So it was not just the composition of the buildings, uh, composition of jobs. Uh, similar results are found for CEP if you look at the period before and after 2000, uh, which is uh, that basically the, they're just following the market trends. There, nothing is special is happening. But this is for CEP highly expected because uh, there was only a 1% uh, participation rate in this program, and what uh, we do not expect that to create a whole lot of jobs. Um, 
about physical improvement. So one of the uh, ideas uh, for the, in the design of these programs seems to be that uh, let us uh, subsidize physical improvements in these buildings. Uh, so by requiring uh, the participant to make investments into the buildings that they are occupying. Um, so the first thing that we want to see is that what was the effect of that $5 minimum expenditure requirements? Did it make people invest more than they would have in the buildings or not? So this table is, is telling us that um, uh, it's telling us the percentage of the participants in the program, and this is only 2010 to 2017 data, um, that spent uh, $6 or less per square uh, feet. So $5 is the requirement. Only 20% of them um, stick to the $6 or less. Uh, even if we double that number uh, to 10, uh, double the minimum expenditure requirement, only 38% of them are spending less than, 30, less than $10. Um, how many people are spending greater than, say, $35? That is 32%. So people who are participating in these programs are spending much more than uh, the minimum expenditure requirements. Um, so any expenditure, since they're since the, what they are receiving in return is just $10 over, over the five years, any expenditures in excess of $10 is definitely considered to uh, have happened without the CRP program. So, um, but the story is a little bit different when we look at the CEP program. Uh, for CEP, $2.5 minimum expenditure requirements are expected. 42% uh, of the applicants stick to $3 or less, and 63 uh, are spending, 63% uh, uh, are spending $6 per square foot or less. Um, but it's still 11% uh, are spending more than $25, or 10 times the minimum expenditure requirement. Um, so this means that uh, there is some, um, there are some differences in the CEP applicants. Uh, so these these folks are uh, mostly uh, in manufacturing uh, on manufacturing leases, and um, the, and and at the same time, even like the two and a half dollar minimum expenditure requirement for some large spaces uh, is going to be is going to be a lot. So, here uh, before explaining this figure, um, the the context is that we are giving uh, tax breaks uh, to to the tenants and owners of these older buildings. And the idea is, do we get our returns on investment in the future? Uh, how do we get, how might we get such returns on investment? Uh, one idea would be that, yes, the vacancy rates are now lower, the buildings are generating more income, and we're getting more property taxes. Uh, what we showed earlier is that that is not happening because of the program, that the vacancy rates are lower on their own, not because of the program. Another channel would be that uh, the owners are now making physical improvements to the buildings, and because of the physical improvements, our assessments of the buildings are going to be higher, so our tax base is going to be higher. Um, here, we want to address whether that is happening. Um, so this is a scatter plot um, with a 45-degree line. On the horizontal axis, we are showing the CRP investment per square uh, footage as found in the CRP application data. On the vertical axis, we are showing the physical improvements per square footage uh, as found in the property tax assessments. Uh, we are aggregating this data for 2010 to 2013 for the CRP but we are giving an additional two years for the property uh, tax assessments to reflect the expenditures. Uh, that is, we are um, averaging them, we are summing them over 2010 to 2015. 
So here we see that a lot of the times there are significant uh, investments made by the CRP applicants, uh, but the physical improvements in our tax records show that uh, the physical changes are zero. Uh, whether this is procedural or legal or whether it is uh, derived, uh, derived by the type of the expenditures that we have here, uh, the conclusion is the same. We are not getting such returns on investments uh, if that was something that we were expecting. So in conclusion, and to wrap this up, um, we find that downtown vacancy rates uh, went down after 1995, but not because of CRP. We find that employment numbers show a similar uh, result. Uh, participation rate uh, in CRP is 22% at its max. For CEP, it was only 1%. Uh, CRP and CEP cost $27.4 million in 2017. And uh, that might be uh, believed as the best indication of what will happen going forward. Uh, summary of findings um, continued. <laughs> uh, we also found that uh, CRP $5 minimum required investments are below the typical for most leases. Uh, CEP 2.5 uh, minimum required investments are more significant. The property tax assessments do not measure the CRP and CEP uh, physical improvements. Um, not only we do not get returns on investment, but it has also limited our ability uh, to um, examine other things that uh, we wanted to using this data set. Uh, further considerations uh, or considerations for the future is that uh, in recent years, Downtown office vacancy rates are very similar to Midtown. We do not have the sparks of 1992 and 1993. Uh, downtown office space is now newer. 421G uh, program um, incentivize a lot of the building owners to convert to residential. Also, at the same time, market forces seem to have done the same. Even post-1975 uh, buildings are now residential that uh, could not receive the 421G uh, uh, benefits. Uh, different industry mix is also uh, present uh, now uh, from what we had in 1995. Um, Participation, also we, we wanted to highlight that the participation rates uh, in CRP are not counter-cyclical. So this program is not, uh, doesn't look like uh, is uh, playing a safety, uh, safety net role for downtown buildings. Uh, recommendations, our recommendations are going to be just procedural. Uh, so one thing is, that, is to include uh, stated goals in the law when we have a new program so, so that every time we want to renew it, we know why are we renewing or are we updating our goals or are, are we sticking to the same goals. And uh, let us have a measurable goals. Uh, that is, let us track goals in the data. For example, vacancy rates. Uh, if we are targeting vacancy rates, uh, we should make uh, preparations to have data on vacancy rates. Uh, return, retaining data of uh, tax expenditure programs uh, seems obvious enough for uh, our evaluation and design going forward, and uh, it would be great to upgrade the collection, uh, collection procedure for the policy evaluations purposes. So uh, the majority of data that we try to utilize uh, for this evaluation uh, came from administrative tax, uh, administrative data that was collected, that were collected for tax purposes and tax administration, um, not specifically for evaluating uh, economic programs. Um, thank you for your time, and we'd be happy to receive questions. Thank you. I think we should give you a cup of water there. Um, <laughs> We were joined by Council, oh, we are joined by Council, or we're joined by Council Member Gibson, Johnson, Levine, Van Bramer, and Cornegie. Um, we have, sorry? Oh. We have um, some questions. For this evaluation of the CRP and the CEP, what do you have left to do? Um, what are the final, what are you looking to include in the final report that were not addressed in today's presentation? 
So the final report uh, includes a lot of our methodological um, ideas of why are we saying what we are saying that we did not discuss here today. Uh, also, it includes uh, a more detailed list of uh, our data limitations and uh, what uh, we think um, uh, might help us uh, in might have helped us in evaluating these programs. So some of the things, uh, some of the data uh, restrictions are um, not having access to like building level data that, that would have been very helpful for our analysis. Um, um, at the same time, um, we will include some notes on the relevance of the program now. Um, given the goals of the program and given the state of the uh, variables that the, um, these goals might track over time. And I think in your recommendations, one of the things that came up in the task force is that across the nation, like the number one problem is that goals are not necessarily clearly stated. Um, sunset sometimes, right? Not all of these um, recommend or these uh, abatements um, are include an end. Um, so we, we're definitely um, happy to see as a committee that, um, that you, we're, the recommendations are very similar to what we were thinking. Um, when, you were when we were negotiating Local Law 18, we had many discussions about funding to ensure that IBO would have the resources it needed to be able to conduct the evaluations. In doing this evaluation, did you face any resource constraints? And do you anticipate any new needs related to the evaluation work we are now required to do? Um, happily, we um, had sufficient resources to do this. Um, we expect uh, the upcoming year to uh, also provide us with sufficient resources to continue this work. We think it's important, and we value the collaboration. Great. Um, and the legislation states that the council and the evaluator will annually set the schedule for evaluations with the idea that at least one tax expenditure will be evaluated each year. Does that schedule still seem reasonable to you based on the amount of work it took to conduct this evaluation? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Um, I mean, one of the reasons we, you know, we don't have the, re the written report done at the end of this calendar year is that you know, this year we got we didn't get started until um, you know I think it was mid-April before we right. settled on what what the uh, program to evaluate was. I expect that that will go that will come earlier in the year next year. Um, and you know we've we've set this up internally on the assumption we're going to do you know one or two of these uh, programs a year. Yep. Great. And now that you've almost completed one evaluation, are there any best practices or lessons learned that you can recommend the next evaluation that we'll conduct, that you'll be conducting next year? Or do you need a couple more under the belt? Certainly a couple more under the belt wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, I think we learned this year, you know, we, we tried to stay in touch with, with the finance staff, um, that's obviously critical to making this work, and we would ex expect to continue doing that. Um, the, you know, some members of the staff attended early uh, um, research, we call them research reviews, uh, uh, an uh, opportunity to hear preliminary results in a, you know, a, a professional setting really go through the, the nuts and bolts of the, the, the methodology or whatever. That was very useful. I think, um, you know, we would expect to do that. I think maybe one, one area might be um, if it's, if the administration is amenable is to bring the administrative agencies into some of that, um, those early meetings. Um, I think this year we were surprised a couple times by you know data that we thought we might be able to get or that would be, have utility that turned out to not be very useful. Okay. Uh, can you talk more about the concept of return on investment? Your presentation indicates um, you defined it as increased property tax revenues. Is this too narrow a definition and could there be other valuable measures by which to look at return on investment? 
Uh, absolutely. So uh, if we are having a program that is increasing employment, uh, that is returns on investment. If we, are, we have a program that is uh, increasing the vacancy rate and that is something that we care about, that is returns on investment. Uh, however, in the absence of, uh, absent finding any of those results, our definition uh, was merely to focus the re returns on investment on another avenue that might have been possible uh, for us, which is we get higher taxes in the future uh, on the tax breaks that we gave today. Great. And I know that we have a great working relationship with DOF, but it's clear that some of the data um, essential is needed from DOF. So my next question is, um, for the three data sets you referenced that exist, um, but which you couldn't access, which is building level vacancy rates, address level employ and employment, and RPIE, mm -hmm. um, did you ask DOF for this information? And if so, I'm sure they said no, and when they said no, um, did they provide the written explanation of the denial required by Local Law 18? I'd have to go back and check on whether, how exactly the, the message was communicated. Um, I'm pretty sure it was probably in emails, which, um, but the, the explanation was that, you know, under current limitations, for example, on the income and expense data, that, you know, that's, it's privileged by state, under state law, and they are not allowed to share that. Um, and they, they explained that to us, I think, on the, um, uh, the building level vacancy data that well actually that also comes from the RPIE and we didn't we didn't have access to that because of that now you you have been able to um, for other evaluations that you've had you've been able to um, kind of I guess gain access to privileged data because you're sworn to keeping I'm sure I, I don't know what the official process is called <laughs> Um, sworn to secrecy. Sworn to secrecy. <laughs> um, and has that ever, was that ever broached or an opportunity in the future to be able to have that data under like sequestered or I, I don't know what the proper term is that you have on. In particular around the RPIE data, um, the issue there is that on some of the data that we are able, uh, much of the property tax data is, is public. And right. The, we we do very well working with finance on, on receiving that data. On the RPI and, and uh, in some other tax administrative data, for example, the commercial rent tax, we are able to get, the, they are able to share commercial rent tax data with us because in the commercial rent tax law, there are provisions that say uh, it can be shared for tax administrative purposes with other city agencies. and. The lawyers have decided that that our relationship qualifies there. The RPIE law. I, I don't want to quote exact chapter and verse, but I, uh, the the RPIE law is written differently, and that particular approach to sharing data with us <laughs> apparently cannot be cannot be fit. Uh, so that it's our understanding that the only solution their inter our understanding of their interpretation of the law is that the only solution is to change the law in Albany. And that's always very easy. Yes. Um, okay, but we can duly leave that as a suggestion for the future council. And while I'm very excited that you were able to communicate with DOF through email, um, the law states that it should be in writing and shared with the council. Um, so we can circle back. And I see DOF out of my peripheral. They're going to be writing that information immediately and getting it to the committee as soon as possible. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the advantages of not being <laughs> over there. Um, through Though there were no stated goals as mentioned in your presentation for either programs, um, they were created to identify, uh, uh, they were created, you identified the goals of the programs to be both to reduce vacancy rates and improve employment. In your opinion, are these goals still relevant in today's market and economy? And do these goals align with the city's current economic development policy goals? That's a very hard question. That's why I asked. <laughs> 
so I want, I want to go back to this vacancy rate uh, figure here. Uh, so in 1992, uh, the vacancy rates were at 22 percent, uh, much a lot by a lot above the historical average. Uh, right now, the vacancy rates in downtown office uh, area uh, are around 10 percent. Um, so it is still a, a large number, but uh, one of the things that uh, we did not discuss is that um, the mix of the buildings in downtown in 1994 was very different. So um, th this is by class B and class A. Class B are basically older, uh, older buildings. And then, uh, and the share of the Class B buildings in downtown is much higher than it is in Midtown, uh, which is the, shown by the green line here. Uh, so that that also has changed over time. Uh, the older, the the worst buildings that remained uh, vacant, presumably, are now residential because they received a lot of incentives to uh, reconstruct and make it residential. And uh, we, can, we, we have traced that in the data. That is uh, about 10% of the gross square footage of downtown is now residential just because of this uh, 421G program. Um, uh, so if we just look at the employment rates in downtown, uh, employment numbers in downtown, they are lower than they were before. But a big factor of that uh, might be uh, that there are now fewer uh, commercial commercial buildings to start with. So uh, we believe that the, I believe that the vacancy rates are are the most important uh, indicator for us and for this policy, and that doesn't ha seem to be an issue anymore like it was in 1992. So I guess your final report will kind of answer whether it is needed um, or um, whether, or I guess have a clearer um, perspective on when housing is competing for commercial space and the conversion thereof and what it can impact, how it will, can impact other areas in our city. Mm -hmm. um, and some of your preliminary findings indicate weak evidence of effectiveness of the program. For example, that it encourages investment in physical improvements, as you mentioned. However, um, you mentioned confounding factors and caution against attributing any increase in investment to the CRP or CEP. What might be these factors be independent of, I guess, of housing, right, which you just said, the conversion of housing? Yes. Um, and is there, a, if there is an effect encouraging investment in physical improvements and CRP and CEP costs effectively, effective in doing so, should the city be paying to support these investments? Um, if I understand the question correctly, uh, it is whether it is uh, encouraging or whether it is improving the level of investments into the buildings. Um, so to some extent, uh, it might be. So we do not have uh, definitive evidence on that. So because we are executing our plan B, basically. Uh, Your so plan B because you didn't have the information? Mm -hmm. and le uh, n not exactly. So the, the plan the plan A was to look at the physical improvements data uh, and compare the physical improvements of the buildings that are in the program and those that are not in the program. Right. Uh, however, in light of this uh, figure, we, we basically found that the Department of Finance data uh, that we have on physical improvements is not a good indicator for what we are trying to track. And it's not a good indicator because they don't track it or they just started tracking it? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I could... Sure. I, I think one of there there are physical improvement. There's data about the physical improvements in the commercial rent in in the the CRP application data. But it turned out that that's only there for 2010 through 2017. Prior to that, it finance like didn't it. capture it. They okay. had people had to fill it out on their forms, but it wasn't stored in any of their databases. And. 
Like, how long do we keep things in storage that is written? Well, on so on the electronic d database, it's it's there as long as someone had entered it originally. Right. Um, for so then we thought, okay, we could go back and we'll look at the paper records from before 2010. And it turned out there that the paper records only went back to 2005 because the, from 2005 to 1995 data had been destroyed. You know, it's, it's understandable why the administration would right. do that. Right. I think one of the suggestions we're going to make is that if, if this, um, poly, this program of doing these evaluations is pursued, that we, working with the council and, and the administration, that there, we come up with a defined list of tax expenditure programs that we want, we expect we're going to be evaluating over the coming years. Right. And that we then identify those files, the files that pertain to those particular set of programs as things that we, we keep, you know, beyond the, 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 the standard retention period precisely to make it possible to go back and do some of these evaluations. Do you know what our standard retention period is now? Um, I'm not familiar with exactly, you know, what finance does, but I mean, I think, you know, each agency sets their rules on, on oh, how okay. they do that. Uh, but it is likely that we will have a lot of these records because now they are collected electronically. Going forward, it's not going to be a big issue, but going right, back Right, but going back, which I think we're going to probably be going back at least for the first five years of these evaluations. Uh, but let me address what our plan B actually does. Right. So um, what we did was... Um, was to say that, okay, $5, five of minimum expenditure requirements are um, in the law, so we expect to see at least them, and we, we can see them. But do people stick to this just $5, or do they go way beyond it? And uh, what we saw is that uh, only 38% of the participants are spending $10 or double the minimum required expenditure uh, or less. The rest of the people, the rest of uh, what will be 62% are spending more than $10. And $10 is the total sum of the property tax abatements that they are receiving. So is that $10 is the maximum of what they can benefit from? Like yes, that's, yes. The, that's the, the, so if they make an improvement greater than 10, that's their decision. Now, um, and you may not be able to answer this, but we've always talked with DDC about the cost of construction, mm -hmm. especially in New York City. So, it, you know, I think if at, at first look you would think, well, maybe they're just being luxurious and wanting to, you know, do these amazing office spaces, but it could also be a factor that it costs more to build in the city, mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Yeah. I, the city is, I'm from the outer borough, so right. they call Manhattan the city. <laughs> um, but I meant Manhattan. Uh, is, is that something that kind of is reflected or, or um, is it just that it's just more luxurious companies are taking advantage of this tax expenditure? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be cost of construction in downtown or it could be simply offices uh, with longer lease terms are spending uh, more money to, to do that. But uh, as, as the CRP, and, uh, CRP program evaluation is concerned, we were wondering if the $5 minimum requirement expenditure is pushing them to do some expenditures that they wouldn't have done before. But we, what, we are, what this is showing is that they would have spent whatever they're spending beyond $10 is not because of the program. Right. It's something that is happening when they are signing a new lease. Whether it is done by the owner or the renter is not clear in our data. But uh, what we know is that they are spending a lot more than the, what we are requiring them. So um, and another way of thinking about it is that the $5 uh, expenditure requirements are not a barrier for their entry or participation in the program because they are spending much more anyway. So should we be increasing the... the it depends. We, we, we are not uh, going to make any recommendations on this. Um, it depends on the goals of the programs uh, going forward. So right. what, are we, what are we trying to target? Uh, 
Right. But, but I mean, I would, you know, we, it's not uncommon in some areas of, of tax policy to have thresholds indexed for inflation or, or some measure right. of, of increasing costs. I mean, this $5 number was set back in 1995 yeah. when, you know, certainly CPI was much less than it, uh, you know, it was different. And, and our vacancy the, the rate was. And the, and the construction uh, cost indices uh, look different. So, I mean, one one possibility or one thing that you know that that um, you know the, the policymakers might want to consider next time this is up for evaluation uh, for extension is indexing that number. Maybe have a one-time jump up on right. it, so that you're if you're if you think you need the incentive to encourage people to make significant investments in the building, you know, have it as a relatively significant level. Right. Five dollars is pretty low these days. Yeah. So it was three and a half dollars in 1995 if we want to compare the inflation-based numbers. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, as part of your evaluation, did you talk, survey, or otherwise interact with any of the recipients of the benefits? I know we did um, some preliminary, re preliminary conversations when we were trying to choose in the task force and kind of better understand both these programs, were you able to make an assessment as to whether the program was administered in a user-friendly manner or whether certain changes, such as paperwork or filing requirements, may be necessary to increase participation and effectiveness of the program? Um, we, we did interview with um, the Downtown Alliance, uh, who, who are a reference point for uh, people who want to participate in different programs that are available to downtown. Um, and uh, we uh, discussed whether they have uh, done any surveys in the past uh, on these programs and seek their advice in doing so. It seems that while we didn't have a chance to uh, survey the people who are Involved, one of the challenges seems to be finding uh, the person in the company. A lot of times it's just a representative firm um, that actually knows about this program at the company. So it, it, it would be very difficult to conduct these surveys, not like surveying a household that you know who is the head of the household. Um, However, so there, there are two facts that we found there is, one is that downtown is a very concentrated area. And um, all the brokers basically know of Downtown Alliance, and a lot of times they're, um, they are receiving phone calls from people uh, who are uh, basically referred to them by the brokers. Uh, that is not happening in the outer boroughs, obviously, because it's a very large area. Um, uh, and uh, at the same time, um, uh, they, so I, it, it would be um, uh, nice to let them speak uh, themselves, but uh, so my understanding is that uh, they uh, sometimes receive calls from people who want uh, the Downtown Alliance to fill out the forms for them and do all of the things, which is not something that they do. Uh, but there might be some difficulties in finding out. For technical for support. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that probably this committee moving forward probably has a role to kind of get some of those um, tenants or um, participants to kind of come in and identify themselves mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll be able to share that information in a, in a different way. Um, yes. I, I would just add, I think, I think in future evaluations, um, That's my next topic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would expect that, you know, if you know, in this case, we were kind of scrambling to pull pull, right. pull something together, and there were you know aspects of of the of the most complete evaluation you'd want to do that um, you know I could see trying to fold in in the next iteration. Right, and I really appreciate. It. I think that we, you know, for the public and for the record, um, we wanted to do this. As you know, my chairmanship is over in I think a couple of hours. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate you coming in to testify at this time because this was really important to me and, and very much legacy setting for this council. So um, I, know, I know that 
you guys are perfectionist and you would rather give it all your information out when you had all of it together and you're you know you're very um, professional in that way so I know that this probably was a little painful to kind of come out and, and testify <laughs> painful might not be the right word but you know uh, I really do appreciate it I want to talk you mentioned about the future the current evaluation program is focused on economic development tax expenditures I have really had to hold members back literally because they I think every meeting and you were privy to many of these meetings wanted to talk about the housing development tax expenditure which is you know, a very large um, tax expenditure and also represents a large financial commitment from our city, um, but are not currently subject to independent evaluation. Has your experience in the first evaluation given you any insight into how you might undertake evaluations of housing development tax expenditures if you were asked to do so? And Department of Finance, don't start tweeting or texting. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I mean, we, we um, th th there's not, nothing that currently precludes us from doing evaluations of, um, of housing, housing development programs, and I think you know, we've done a fair number over the years, particularly focused around uh, 421A um, and, and, and some others. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think we have, you know, we, we have a pretty good sense of how you do those, and uh, I would expect we're going to continue doing those, whether they come as part of a formal, you know, this formal process, or um, you know, studies that are undertaken at the request of individual council members, or or studies that we initiate on our own. Right. I think um, this formal process would be great. And do you see that there is, you know, obviously, we had some resources to invest. Um, so that we could get to this point. If you were to undertake the housing component, what would be a guesstimation? I don't want to hold you um, to this number, but just as we start looking to the future, and so we're able to share with members that are going to be joining this committee, the you know the next committee chair, on what the cost you think would be if you had to evaluate a housing um, expenditure and a business tax expenditure at the same time. And We've done these in the past. Um, so you need no money? Uh, we always need money. But <laughs> the last few years, IBO has actually been in an unusual position because our budget, as you know, is based on OMBs. Right. And much of the funding for the Hurricane Sandy repairs is flowed through OMB. Right. So we've had extraordinary surplus. But that will change in the future, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Sandy will change. repairs are kind of sl um, Slowly, coming to an end. Yeah, we're, they're ending. Um, and so constraints that, I mean, it was not even remotely a constraint this year. Um, going ahead, if we were to be running multiple evaluation programs, yeah, we would need to add staff. And right. we might need assistance on doing that. Okay. But happily, till now, it has not been a problem. Okay. Um, and do you have any recommendations on which expenditures should be evaluated next? I know you stated a, that we should be working on a list um, so that for the, from the data perspective, but is there anything that you, have, having done all the work that you've done for all these years, is there any you know, top three that you think we should be looking at? Um, Staying on, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm assuming you, you're, you mean if we keep with the current definition of uh, economic development. Right. Okay, so, I mean, in there, there are a number of, you know, if, if you think about it sort of from the size of the program perspective, I mean, one of the biggest is ICAP. Um, now, the, the Council Finance right. Committee okay. did a, a, you know, a very effective study on that just a year or two ago. So. Although that certainly qualifies, I mean, I could I could see um, why you might look there first. I think we, you know, that th there's an inefficiency there if you, if if we made that our our next objective. I think some of the other uh, business tax ones are focused fairly tightly on a handful of buildings. Uh, you know, there's Madison Square Garden, 
but I'm not sure how much you, <laughs> what, what there is to do a whole year study around uh, that, that particular. Uh, you mean you don't need a whole year? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, right. <laughs> um, you know, and, and similarly, the, I mean, I think the, the Chrysler building exemption is on the, the list. You know, the, maybe you roll a couple of them into one. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's at least one that comes to mind is, is the REAP program, which would also be, you could be building off of some of the same data and some of the same focus that we've been putting into Lower Manhattan. The REAP program obviously is, you know, is largely focused on Lower Manhattan. REAP would run into, immediately run into the data problems because that's administered through the city's general corporation tax and um, I guess and also the unincorporated business tax. But both of those taxes, uh, the legislation doesn't seem to allow any provision for sharing data in any way with, um, with us. Uh, so that, again, the, the, the law would have to be changed in Albany. That's, that's the interpretation we've received from uh, the Department of Finance. Okay, so we're going to be looking at um, some opportunities that we can make some recommendations for our Albany um, um, uh, legislative kind of response and, and engaging. So I think that's great. We're going to now hear from Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Madam Chair, and especially to the staff and to the IBO. I, I am just getting here, and I, I don't really have yet a lot of questions about this particular report, but I just want to say uh, one more time how grateful I am to you and to the staff for doing this process and promise that your colleagues, after you're gone, will not forget this task force and these annual reports and that it's incumbent on the Council uh, to really follow through on this legislation and on these reports. It's just this is such a so easy for government to not pay attention to things like this. It's challenging to kind of pay enough attention, see what's working, see what's not working, have the discipline to do it. When times are good, it's especially easy. Um, we'll see what happens. There's obvious reasons with the tax bill in particular to fear that we're gonna have to pay a lot more attention to things in the, in the years ahead. So I'm grateful that we have uh, this process in place and I look forward to uh, continuing your legacy and continuing to push forward and make sure we pay attention and fight to get the changes that we that we need based on the analysis that will be done under it. So thank you. Thank you, Brad. I really appreciate it and I'm sure that the, div the division staff is also very grateful to know that they have an advocate in you. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm excited for the future. I think we have a great opportunity to save our city some money but also create tax expenditures that generate exactly what the goals are. Um, I think we've already, are a, you know, we've already made history by creating this. Um, so I thank you for your partnership. I thank the Department of Finance for their continued support. And I'm looking forward to watching you all from Maryland um, and seeing, oh, <laughs> that was really funny, huh? <laughs> Yes. Um, thank you so much for all your time. And I officially call my last oversight hearing adjourned. <laughs>